name Harry McGuire, and the director of Community Restorative Justice Ireland. I like to think of restorative justice, uh, and you need to sort of try to sort of maybe demystify this type of stuff. This is this is about you know two people or more unable to resolve whatever the dispute is, uh, and they bring in a third party, and they have a very difficult conversation. But in reality, we do this in our own houses. We do this in our own lives. We do this within within whatever set of relationships we we find ourselves in. All the time, people are coming to people and saying, Look, let's get the hell in, hammer it out, let's sort it out. We have found ourselves in, in maybe situations, you know, you know that dreaded walk home where you know there's an issue has to be dealt with at home and the dread of it. And yet when you get into the house and it's dealt with, the lightness that comes with it, the liberation that comes with it, the, the sort of sense of, yeah, I've achieved something here. Something that was, you know, really bugging me or annoying me or something that I was actually losing sleep over. It's now resolved. This is the part of dialogue. And uh, in terms of the practice of it, you know, it, 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 it works. Uh, and it works because people want it to work. In terms of the North here, it's rooted in the, the peace process. And uh, as people were grappling with the sort of the big politics, the high wire sort of uh, stuff, uh, other people, uh, human rights activists, youth workers, Republicans, community workers were starting to get the grips with what was happening actually on the ground. And one of the key issues, uh, I suppose, moving forward uh, was how would you tackle crime and anti-social behaviour uh, in a new space? and uh, people stumbled more onto the restorative justice model because discussions had been ongoing and uh, everything that people were talking about fitted into the restorative uh, justice and the restorative practice model. So it was, it was really about how do you deal, particularly with young people, uh, moving out of a conflict who are still being uh, harmed by armed groups and how do you change that on the ground because while the while the sort of combatants weapons were falling silent uh, young people were still being shot and injured uh, and not just young people but particularly young people were being shot and injured in communities such as this the international context was was important for us and in, in a sense that we had people coming from america who were uh, delivering training and uh, and they were giving us a, a I suppose a worldview of what restorative justice and restorative practice can look like. They were also talking about uh, the the Aboriginal Americans and how many of these practices were developed in, in those communities. They were talking about the wigwams and the circles and sitting around in circles and pace pipes and you know let's 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 have a pie and and all of that sort of stuff. And of course, that, that very much attracted people from, from my community uh, because you identify with, uh, with societies that have been literally sort of obliterated in some senses. And to know that these practices are, are ancient, are around the world, it gives you a sense, well, look, why can't we do it here? And then when you, when you draw the connections and the comparisons into the clan system, and into the Breton system, then you're saying, yeah, well, we could. I'm quite sure the Irish would be capable of uh, having a difficult conversation around a round table and uh, coming up with a solution. So the international, the international context was important. Uh, having people from a, a different environment come in uh, was important. But I also think, because uh, I remember those days very well, there was a, there was a huge suspicion about ex prisoners being involved. But when you're in this community, you also understand the power that comes with being an ex-prisoner and the access to your community that comes with being an ex-prisoner. And uh, I suppose the fair, fair weather that can come with that. And uh, if you're going to make change on the ground, then involve the stakeholders. <laughs> That's a lesson. And uh, ex-prisoners or ex-combatants or whatever sort of language you want to use, if you can't involve people who were part of creating the informal system, 
and actually starting to change it uh, and redirect the energies of it, then who else would you? Would you involve? So, you know, we, 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 we lived through that. And again, international experience was good in terms of having some knowledge on around uh, issues like that. But certainly the, 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 the international framework and be able to say, look, you know, there's, there's a internationally recognized standards of and, and principles and practice. Uh, and we adapted those, those standards. So uh, it, it, lent, it lent something to the project. The thing with restorative justice and restorative practice, uh, it, 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 it's an international concept. It, it, it's very much uh, ingrained with indigenous societies. Uh, a bit like our own society in Ireland with, that, that had the Breton law, uh, and we look very much back to that sort of lineage and that sort of linkage of uh, reparation rather than uh, retribution. So the, the thing that really attracted uh, people towards the restorative justice was that it came with a set of uh, internationally recognized principles and values and standards. And the values were, were really attractive in a sense that you're developing a peace process. You were saying to people, look, you know, the old enemies here uh, are starting to move towards the table. Dialogue was going to be the means of resolving the conflict and then transfer that into your own community. So you say to your own community, well, how do we resolve disputes within the, the community? You know, should it be a neighbor dispute or should it be something much more serious? Dialogue should be the way. Uh, and dialogue is a key element uh, of restorative practice. And then there's, 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 there's values like transparency, responsibilities, accountability, honesty, openness, non-judgmental approaches, support for both the victim uh, and the offender and the community in which offences take place. And it's about sort of bringing, those, bringing that framework uh, to the table that then informs how you actually run a restorative justice uh, process. Policing, in the, in the aftermath of 1969, policing as we know it uh, has all but been withdrawn from the sort of niceness Republican heartland areas. Uh, and as the conflict took hold, as in every, every conflict uh, shown throughout the world, people still wanted to feel safe. And uh, the armed groups who were in existence then, uh, their, their rationale for really emerging onto the streets was about defending their communities. And whether you defend your community from an enemy who's outside, or you defend your community from someone who's trying to harm it from within, uh, it was seen as a, a defensive action. And from that sort of mindset, uh, over a, a, an extended period of 25 years, uh, there was a development of what would be, uh, or what would be known as the informal system. Uh, and the informal system by uh, 1994, 1995, uh, was really ingrained into the culture of these communities. Uh, people hadn't bought into the, the normal sort of day-to-day uh, -day existence of a criminal justice system. In fact, uh, people in these communities seen the criminal justice system as being a system which was harmful to them, which had uh, uh, hurt and injured and maimed and killed people in these communities, had sentenced uh, a huge, an enormous amount of people from these communities into prison, uh, and and were part of the of the conflict. So the 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 informal system became, I would say, one of the dominant elements uh, within these communities, and. As the, as the weapons uh, fell silent uh, in ceasefire, the weapons within the informal system didn't. Uh, in fact, in some cases, they got louder. Well, you know, it was, it was a, a group of academics, uh, Kieran McAvoy been among them, uh, youth workers, human rights uh, activists, and Republicans who, who came together to have a discussion about, well, look, how would you make interventions? How could, you, how could you change what was happening uh, within communities around sort of what's loosely called punishment violence? And that's not a, that's not a, a term we, we like, uh, but it kind of way is the accepted term. Uh, 
So it was about how do you change it? Uh, and those discussions uh, went on for some considerable period of time. I think they began in 1993 or late 92, early 93. Uh, and by 1996, uh, they had uh, written down the content of those discussions. And in the aftermath of actually writing it down, uh, they stumbled on this concept, this model called restorative justice, restorative practice. And while that was happening, Nick, uh, I was actually in prison. Uh, and we were discussing this sort of issue uh, in terms of uh, what our views would be. Uh, and there were some materials starting to uh, be sent into the prison to sort of facilitate or, or sort of turn our minds towards these types of debates because they were, they, they were, they were big issues. They were huge issues. They were one of the sort of uh, variable type discussions. Uh, if if the politics of the peace process was to actually arrive at negotiations and a deal, what would that mean in terms of policing? Because policing in itself, uh, and of course the wider criminal justice system was a huge issue. Those are the the common uh, mis misconceptions is that it's. Uh, a soft option. People tend to, to, to see it as a soft option. Sure, you know, what good's talking about it going to? Uh, and really, when you when you start to sort of unpack that uh, or unpack it, uh, if, if you look at a situation where where someone is, is, is taken away and shot in, in these communities, their behaviour isn't challenged. They have been punished for what has been considered or what they have been found guilty of. Uh, and that's not saying the word guilty, but found guilty of and punished. And uh, the behaviour, the action, the victim, has very little say in that, in that process. So someone from an armed group takes it on themselves to say, right, we're going to resolve that. And that's how it's resolved. Uh, and then you take the formal criminal justice system. Someone's uh, arrested taken away in question, charged, appeared before a court and gets put in prison or is sanctioned. Their behaviour uh, very often is never challenged during that whole process. And again, where's the voice of the victim and where is the role of community in terms of resolution? The process of uh, restorative justice is very much about saying to victims uh, and the community, Come round the table. Let's talk about what has happened. Let the person who has offended both the victim and the community explain their actions. Let the, let the victim hear and understand what the motivations were. Let the community understand that. And let all three be part of forming what is a workable solution. And of course, for the, the offender, it will very often be the first time they will have had this sit in the company of a victim and listening to a victim's concerns. And some victims, when you, when you mention the word victim, people think of old people or frail people or people who are, you know, hiding from whatever has happened. We have some very angry victims. I think if you look at, at for instance, legacy issues in this community and you look at the powerful, strong people, who have been victims uh, of violence. So we have people who, who really want to have that conversation, who want to tell the offender, here's what you've done. Here's how you have harmed me. Stealing my TV didn't harm me. Invading my space. Taking away my security. Doing damage to my view of my own home and how I feel in my own home. That's huge stuff. And for people to hear that, that can be a very challenging confrontation or a very challenging setting. And for you to sit and listen to that, then, you know, you are listening and you're seeing the fact of it. And, and, and that's when you're into the, the, the actual potential of change. Whereas if you take someone away, you shoot them, they go to the hospital, they have their wounds and they continue on in pain. You have people put in prison Many of those people still deny that they're involved in anything because the process lends itself to how do, you, how do you deal with it? You try to get out of it. You try to get off it. 
you try to uh, create a deal situation. As you know, you know many people will go before a court, and up until the point where a solicitor or a barrister will tell them, look, there's no other choice here. You need to sue for for a deal. Up until that point, they're trying to escape any consequences of their actions. In fact, they, many of them will look at the victims as being the reason they're in front of the court, not their own behaviour. This process reverses that. This process is about those people taking responsibility. You say to do that. And and then moving on to address it. That's quite a difficult process. I, I, I have been in a very privileged place to sit through sort of mediations and and, uh, and conferences where, where, where that, that has actually happened, of where people have come in, literally like, you know, daggers drawn, you know, the atmosphere is like, a, it's like stepping into a butcher's fridge. And within, you know, a short period of time, uh, you can feel that, that, that chill starting to uh, dissipate and you're into the real sort of change process of people actually listening, people acknowledging. It's actually a big thing. It's a big issue for a victim to have their issue acknowledged of someone saying, yes, I did do that. I did do that. And I apologise for it. And I'm sorry for that. You know, and, you know, think of some of the, the more public issues that we have had over this past uh, 20, 30 years of where you, ha- you hear victims saying, you know, if it even hadn't been acknowledged. So this is, this is big stuff for victims. And then for someone who acknowledges the hurt and uh, the pain they've caused or the damage that they've done or recognising, you know, the material, issues or material effects that they have taken and stolen and, and whatever. For for them to acknowledge that, there's a challenge that comes with it. It's not about acknowledging it and saying, well, you know, okay, I've done that and let's move on. That's not that's not how this this works. That's not the psychology of this. Uh, and it's not the framework that we, we promote. I like to think of I like to think of restorative justice. Uh, and you need to sort of try to sort of maybe demystify this type of stuff. This is, this is about, you know, two people or more unable to resolve whatever the dispute is uh, and they bring in a third party and they have a very difficult conversation. But in reality, we do this in our own houses. We do this in our own lives. We do this within, within whatever set of relationships we, we find ourselves in. All the time, people are coming to people and saying, Look, let's get the hell in, hammer it out. Let's sort it out. We have found ourselves in, in maybe situations, you know, you know that dreaded walk home where you know there's an issue has to be dealt with at home and the dread of it. And yet when you get into the house and it's dealt with, the lightness that comes with it, the liberation that comes with it, the, the sort of sense of, yeah, I've achieved something here. Something that was, you know, really bugging me or annoying me or something that I was actually losing sleep over. It's now resolved. This is the part of dialogue, and uh, in terms of the practice of it, you know, it, 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 it works, uh, and it works because people want it to work. Well, I suppose, uh, I have to say, within, within the Republican nationalist communities, uh, it, was a, it was a huge debate uh, on, that was undertaken. Much of it, I have to say, was done by the time I, I had been released, but I, I was involved in some of it. Uh, there was quite, quite a lot of challenges uh, put to us because people tend to, when people debate these things, they tend to go to the nuclear options. You know, what if, and it's a worst crime, for instance, you know, someone's murdered, what are you going to do about that? We're not here to, to resolve uh, deep end crime, but we're here to say, look, how do we change what young people are being shot for? How do we, how do we work with that? How do we work against uh, violence in our communities that the people are attacking each other or attacking each other over drink or there's a fight between two neighbours or there's a dispute between a builder and a member of our community and how do we ensure it doesn't erupt into something much more difficult? How do we stop that? How do we make that intervention?
And how do we do it in a way which is respectful both to the victim, but he equally expects respects the the offender, and then the community, which is very often impacted. It's very often the the sort of the the silent victim in these in these uh, incidents. If if you have two families fighting uh, in a street, uh, abusing each other, uh, threatening to harm and hurt each other, and you have young kids in the street and other families in the street. Who are listening to this? Who are watching this? Who are being impacted by this? You know, families who are saying, "Look, don't we get out on the street tonight? Something might happen. You could be, you could actually be physically hurt in our street tonight." So, you know, how do you go in? How do you want to change it? Uh, and for us, it was about just using dialogue. Uh, and I have to say, one of the things that has always been, I've always found remarkable about this type of work, is People can be actually very, very sensible when you start to have these discussions uh, and can be even more sensible when, it, when it's a bit come on the table to resolve it. Uh, and we have, we have dealt with some really sort of quite heavy issues and heavy disputes here. Uh, but all through the, the good grace of people saying, yeah, we need to resolve this. Because I, 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 have, sat, I have sat in homes and, and I have said to people, look, you know, one punch can kill. One punch can brain damage, damage somebody. And before we get to those those situations, let's get around the table. Let's let's talk this out. Because if it does get into that other arena and someone is brain damaged and someone is killed, you can't bring that back. You can't bring that back in the grave. That's never coming back. And in situations like that, people go to prison go to prison for a long time. In situations like that, families hate each other for generations. And there's a trip feed in the generations. You can affect kids who aren't even born with this type of dispute that you actually hate and loathe another family who live in the same community. So, you know, there's, 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 there's big bonuses. There's big praises for people to get around the table and say, right, let's stop this now. That's if we have been in the wrong. Let's hold our hands up and say yes. But here's why here's why we got ourselves in that situation. We either assumed something, we were told something, or you done something and we misinterpreted it, or whatever. But let's on let's unpack the box and let's find a resolution. And we have done that in thousands of cases now. I think it's unlimited because it it when you focus on resolution and you do it in a way in which there's a framework and there's a process, then you come out with better, better results. And not only better results, you come out with strengthened belief, strengthened trust, and better relationships between people. Because if we're nothing else, we're a community of people. And if we see the world in a, in a not too dissimilar way. And if we are prepared, if issues of difference open up between us, if we are prepared to say, yeah, well, let's get around the table. And let's just be honest about it. Let's be honest about our own actions and let's be honest about it. Then, you know, you're moving into a different space. Uh, we have done this sort of work in, in, in schools. Uh, and I remember actually a teacher making a comment when, when she's seen, for instance, a restorative circle. Uh, an action and the teacher said she had never seen the boys behaving so maturely and the reason for that was because the framework was created to allow them to behave maturely because it wasn't about punishment it was about what happened who was harmed by what had happened and then how do you repair the harm how do you repair that and I would challenge anybody that, uh, that you know, in the school in West Belfast, uh, on the final day of this teacher who had been harmed by actions of her, the pupils in the class, on, the, on her final day, the boys got together and presented her with a bunch of flowers. I've never heard that before in a school in West Belfast. So something moved, something changed. And 
during the course of the, the circle, for a number of boys to say, no way to do it. That was me done that. That's change. So I think I think, you know, let's look at the praise here. Let's focus on the praise. Uh, and let's develop it or spread it out and, and do what we can to create a different society. Um, my name's Debbie Waters. I'm the director and one of the founding members of Northern Ireland Alternatives, which is a community-based restorative justice organisation. So um, restorative justice has been around for centuries. It's an age-old concept and mostly indigenous peoples across the world, like Native Americans and the Maoris and tribes like that. Um, we're using it as a way of problem solving and a, as a way of doing justice. So really it's all about um, non-violence, it's all about non-adversarial approaches and it's really about humanising conflict. So it asks questions like who has been hurt, what's their responsibility, and who are the victims and how can we make things as right as possible. So in the States, um, probably the restorative movement has been pushed ahead by the Quakers and the Mennonites. So very much non-violent faith-based organisations that wanted to use non-adversarial approaches. Um, and when I moved to the States back in 1992, my first job well, I was working a lot with the Mennonites at that stage, married to a Mennonite, and um, very quickly became introduced to restorative justice and restorative practice. Worked in that field for five years, um, and I suppose very quickly I understood that it would have resonance back in our culture and back in Northern Ireland because we were a community in transition. And what better philosophy, values, techniques to use than this very much human approach that would bring people to the table and allow them to talk to each other through mediation and through other techniques. So that's how I got involved, moved back from the States in about 90, 1996, 1997, and very quickly became involved in restorative practice, initially in the Shankill. Um, so it started in the Shankill in 1997 within a loyalist community at the same time a similar process was happening within West Belfast. And then we very quickly began to grow the organisation. So Alternatives now has six offices, actually seven offices, two new ones in Macrofelt and Portadown. Um, and we have about a staff team of 45 and about 300 trained volunteers, all doing restorative practices, predominantly in socially disadvantaged communities and in post-conflict communities. So Alternatives started in about 1997 and it really um, grew out of the peace talks and probably also out of the whole political situation at that time where there was a vacuum in policing. Um, communities, armed groups were on ceasefire, but communities were still involved in summary justice or paramilitary style attacks. And at that stage, probably around the 96 mark, um, some communities began to ask themselves if we're on ceasefire and we're no longer using violence against our enemy or our perceived enemy, why are we using summary justice practices to place our own communities? So people were looking for a way forward, a non-violent way forward, and um, I had just moved back from the States where I had been running a restorative justice program just south of Chicago. And so I was able to bring the restorative element to the Shankill and help them think differently about how they do, would do that. So we began to look at using restorative practices as a way to intervene in punishment style attacks and work non-violently and non-punitively with young people particularly under threat around antisocial behaviour. I suppose in terms of the development of the restorative agenda in Northern Ireland, initially Alternatives and Community Restorative Justice Ireland most of our work was in the justice sector. So we were working with police, we were working to help heal relationships between the community and the police, we were working with probation, we were helping offenders think about the hurt and harm they had caused. 
but very quickly we realised that restorative interventions could be used in schools, it could be used in the health service, it could be used in the housing sector, and so we began to develop into those sectors, non-justice sectors, which is where the term restorative practice came from. And I suppose the whole programme of STARS, striving towards a restorative society, which is funded under the executive office and under the Tackle and Power Militarism programme, that is really about embedding restorative practice in all sectors. Those in terms of the development of the restorative agenda in Northern Ireland, initially Alternatives and Community Restorative Justice Ireland, most of our work was in the justice sector. So we were working with police, we were working to help heal relationships between the community and the police, we were working with probation, we were helping offenders think about the hurt and harm they had caused. But very quickly we realised that restorative interventions could be used in schools, it could be used in the health service, it could be used in the housing sector, and so we began to develop into those sectors, non-justice sectors, which is where the term restorative practice came from. And I suppose the whole programme of STARS, striving towards a restorative society, which is funded under the executive office and under the Tackle and Power Militarism programme, that is really about embedding restorative practice in all sectors. So it's about growing the work not only in the justice sector, but helping school teachers think, how can I work differently in the classroom? It's about helping social workers think, how can I work differently with families and do that work restoratively? And it's about helping youth workers and community workers think about an added dimension to their work. And so one of the big things was when we went into schools, we heard a lot of shouting and a lot of kids were put out of the classroom, a lot of suspensions, and really part of the restorative ethos is to say, how can you do that differently? So can you work non-violently and in a non-adversarial way to deal with conflict differently in school, to retain the young person in the school environment and heal relationships? It's also about helping social workers think differently about their work, it's about helping youth workers and community workers think differently. So rather than excluding young person from a youth club, let's get everybody in a restorative circle. Let's start talking about what happened there, why did it happen, and how could we have managed that or done, or done that differently. And I suppose the key to it is really about helping the people in conflict think about their responsibility in that and then how can they make it right. So it really turns things on its head. So normally we exclude people in conflict. This is about saying, let's talk about it. Let's resolve it together. And your responsibility is to make things as right as you possibly can. Suppose what restorative practice has to offer in a post-conflict society is some of the key values, and some of those are non-violence. Um, engagement, having everyone around the table who has a stake in the process, um, openness, transparency, and those values are, and confidentiality, those values underpin everything that we do. And I suppose then the framework that comes with that is a framework that asks those key restorative questions. Who has been hurt? What's the responsibility to make things right as possible? and where are the victims in this process. So it's about giving people that have been hurt and harmed a voice and a stake in the process and giving them ownership over that. So some of the work that we have done around that, and this is really pertinent to STARS, is for example, a school in North Belfast, a young person assaulted a teacher. And rather than the teacher wanting that pupil excluded from the classroom or excluded from the school environment, they contacted us and said, we'd really like a restorative process. So we went into the school, we worked with the young person around, why did you do that? What was going on in your life? What was going on in the school environment? We worked with the teacher around what was going on in the classroom, and then we brought the two of them together. And that ended up in a face-to-face -face meeting where the young person apologised and they collectively 
put together a restorative plan as to how they could make things as right as possible. So it wasn't just about the pupil changing, it was about the teacher thinking, how could I have managed that situation differently? And so if you compare that to a situation where a young person is either suspended or excluded from school, no work is done with them, there's no learning, and they're brought back a month later. Loads of kids say to us, Debbie, I do my best to be excluded or suspended every day. That's what I want. So we're saying to the schools, listen, you, to build a restorative school and to nurture a different kind of environment, you need to do business differently. And many schools and many sectors, the housing sector is now looking at mediation to resolve um, disputes between tenants rather than putting tenants out. How can we support you in your vulnerability and how can we support you so that you can retain your tenancy? It's a very different way of doing business. And why it works so well in Northern Ireland is we've come out of a conflict. We know how to do violence. We know how to do aggression and we do that very, very well. What this does is offer a very different way and say to people, Let's look at that through a different lens and watch your responsibility through that lens. So it promotes ownership, it promotes equality, and it promotes bringing the marginalised to the table. And I suppose in building, in true peace building, that's what true peace building should look and feel like on a daily basis. And I think that's why the STARS programme really, really is needed in our society because it offers everyone a way to do restorative business. In practice, restorative work looks differently depending on the different sectors that you're involved in. So for example, in alternatives, when we're working with a young person who's maybe been under threat by an armed group because of their involvement in antisocial behaviour, we'll intervene in that situation and we'll take the young person through a process of looking at how their actions have hurt the victims, their community themselves and their family, and they'll develop a restorative plan around that as to what they plan to do to make things as right as possible. I suppose the key elements to it is involving the victim and giving them a voice and allowing them to talk about how they've been hurt and harmed by crime or antisocial behaviour but also involving the young person and saying, listen, we understand that things in your life aren't great. So this process is also about empowering you to make changes, as well as you taking responsibility for the hurt and harm that you've caused. So that process for us and alternatives can take about 10 months. So a young person can work through the restorative plan and at some stage that will move to mediation, where the young person and the victim will sit down together in a facilitated process face to face and talk about what happened. A lot of people critique restorative work because they say it's a soft option. I want to say today it is not easy to sit face to face with your victim. In fact, it's much easier to go through the court system where it's impersonal, where you don't have to take personal responsibility and where it's not humanised for you. In the restorative world, it's very difficult to do that. And I, at one point, had a young person say to me, Debbie, I really would have preferred to take my beating mm -hmm. than do this because this is emotionally and psychologically painful. It's not supposed to be easy to, to face up to the hurt and harm that you've caused and walk through that journey is not easy, but it's about emotional change, it's about psychological change, and that's how we get long-term change, and that's how we transform communities and build peace. So for us, that one example of what it looks like on a daily basis for a young person, I think really signals that it's hard work, um, it gives everyone a voice and involves everyone in the process, but it also the benefits are great. Our recidivism rate in alternatives sits at about 10%. That's really high compared to the formal criminal justice system, where it, for young people it sits about 40% care, and might correct me on this, but if you're coming out of prison, 
um, most people will, 80% of people will reoffend within 12 months. So restorative practice is economically beneficial, but in terms of reoffending, it reduces the rates dramatically. And I think if you don't buy into, if you're a political party that doesn't buy into restorative practices from a philosophical point of view, because you're a lock them up and throw away the key person, buy into it from an economic point of view. For us to work with a young person for a year costs about £2,000. For them to go through the system in Northern Ireland for a year probably costs about sixty or £70,000. So I think um, Justice, the Executive Office, all government departments need to be looking at this as a way forward and need to begin looking at this as a way of doing core business. Um, the STARS programme is um, a programme that is funded under recommendation B4 and Communities in Transition, so it's through the Executive Office and it's around that whole area of tackling paramilitarism. Yeah? So STARS is really, really important in terms of the non-violence piece, in terms of empowering local communities to solve their own problems rather than turning to paramilitaries or others. Um, and so we have worked really hard over the past three years around STARS, striving towards building a restorative society and embedding those principles. So the key areas that we've been working in, Alternatives has been working in the Shankill, East Belfast, Carrick and Larne and Bangor. And CRJ has been running STARS in Lurgan, West Belfast, North Belfast and parts of Derry. Yeah, so those have been the focus for us. The focus, they're probably deemed some of the most vulnerable communities, some of the communities with the highest levels of paramilitary activity. And we've been coming into that situation and trying to embed restorative practice as a way of, a different way of doing business. So who we've been working with has been very diverse. We've been working with community workers, we've been working with youth workers, we've been working with the housing executive, the police, other statutory agencies, social housing providers, um, extern, Bernardos, and other groups that are doing business in those communities. And we've been saying, how about introducing a restorative arm to your work? And I suppose people would say, what would that look and feel like? So for Conswater Homes, for example, in the east of the city, what they're looking at doing is becoming a restorative organisation. So they're looking at their policies, how can they make them more restorative, right down to how can we use mediation to help resolve disputes between our tenants who live in our social housing estates. Yeah, So that's major. So rather than just moving tenants on and putting them out, if they're either involved in a neighbourhood dispute or they're involved in antisocial behaviour, or they're demonstrating vulnerability of some kind around mental health, we're saying use restorative interventions in that situation. Work with the tenants, find out, get beneath the surface, find out what's really going on in their situation, and then bring them together directly in mediation. So it really is about empowering the most vulnerable, saying you are part of our community and you have a stake in our community and rather than just excluding you we want to build your capacity we want to give you the tools to live differently in a social housing estate and we want to support you long term what would have happened in the old system was that paramilitaries might have threatened them and put them out or the social housing provider might have said, your behaviours reached the threshold where you can no longer maintain your tenancy. So STARS has turned that on its head. And we want to continue with that over the next number of years. Hopefully, if we're successful with phase two of STARS, we want to go even deeper, go broader, work with more people. And it's not about growing alternatives or CRJ. It's about helping people to grow the restorative arm of their work where they are. Uh, my name is Karen McAvoy. I'm a professor of law and transitional justice here in Queens in Belfast. Um, my involvement in restorative justice came about as a result of myself and three other people who were involved in 
trying to persuade the IRA um, to cease punishment violence and to replace punishment violence with community-based restorative justice. So that was 20-something years ago when I've been involved on, on, as a board member of CRJI ever since. Philosophy of restorative justice is a focus upon repairing relationships um, rather than on punishing offenders. Um, and so what that means in practice is involving all of the parties um, to a crime or antisocial behaviour and trying to find non-violent human rights compliance solutions to that. The parties involved um, are the victim, obviously, um, the offender, um, community, how, in whatever shape or form that looks like. And some people would have, as a fourth player in that, by uh, just automatically, the state. And when I'm um, talking about restorative justice, I have a dotted line to the state. So from my own perspective, um, the, the philosophy of restorative justice is about as long as you're resolving problems in a community in a lawful and human rights compliant fashion, the state has to negotiate a position. So the state has to, the state doesn't automatically assume a right to be at the table because if you're if you're behaving lawfully, the state doesn't necessarily need to be there. There are certain things only the state can do. So part of the philosophy of restorative justice is is that is the restoration of relationships involving all of the parties to the dispute and where necessary, um, involving state agencies who may have specialist skills or expertise in resolving it. And that's that's the broad philosophy of it. But the, the central tenet of all of this. Is, is that it is non, non-violent and that it is human rights compliant, focused on resolving problems rather than simply on punishing perpetrators. The origins, the international origins of restorative practice um, are in indigenous communities. So in, um, for example, um, Aboriginal, Aboriginal communities in Australia, um, Maori communities in New Zealand, Aboriginal communities in Canada, um, Native American um, communities, and also actually here in Ireland, Brehan law, Brehan legal traditions within when, when our pre-colonial Ireland tribal societies. The focus in, in all of those contexts was on restoring relationships rather than simply punishing offenders. And in probably the 1970s, 1980s in Australia and New Zealand in particular, you had a huge over-representation, you still do, you have a huge over-representation of indigenous peoples within the formal criminal justice system. Um, and so, you know, if, you, if, you're, if your Aboriginal community is hugely overrepresented, in effect what's happening here is there's a disconnect between um, the Aboriginal experience and white man's justice and it's man's justice. It's just culturally something's not working here and they recognize that. And so um, criminal justice authorities and communities started to think, can we do something here to incorporate Aboriginal tradition within the way in which we address crime and antisocial? And that spread essentially. And it spread originally, restorative justice was primarily focused on dealing with young people. Nowadays, it includes adults. It includes, like the area that I work in primarily is on post-conflict justice. And so even issues like, you know, crimes of mass violence, genocide, for example, that you've seen in Rwanda, a variant of restorative justice attempted to address the after effects of the Rwanda genocide in Truth and Reconcil- the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa and other Truth and Reconciliation Commissions explicitly say, well, this is a restorative way, you know, truth and reconciliation are restorative values moving away from the punishment of the offender. So that's the, inter- so the international origins are that. They are, they are Aboriginal peoples, including here in Ireland, but it has adapted and evolved to from very small minor infractions, both in justice or in school settings or in, to the most heinous crimes you can imagine, you know, like genocide, there's nothing more serious than that, and, and everything in between. I mean, I was aware of, um, of restorative justice as a concept. Um, I came from an activist background, a human rights activist background. I used to work for a charity here, a prisoner's rights charity called NIACRO. Um, and so we were kind of interested anyway in the ways in which restorative justice, for example, was used in the prisons to resolve disputes within prisons. I'd been to South Africa and I had seen um, community-based restorative justice um, there as part of the transition, challenging cultures of violence, as some people will be aware One of the aspects of the South African conflict and transition was that you had things like necklacing happening in communities where, you know, alleged informers um, on the um, on the side of the apartheid state um, informing against liberation forces. And I had seen restorative efforts to try to challenge that. And also in the South African context, you had an analogous situation where um, police had no legitimacy, state police had no legitimacy. So I had seen that um, and then post the ceasefires here. Um, essentially, the ceasefires here, both loyalist and republican, were cessations of military operations. They did not include policing operations. What that, me- that meant in practice was that uh, punishment violence continued. And so for some, 
um, the continuance of punishment violence after the ceasefires was proof that the IRA and the loyalists were not serious about about ceasing violence. Um, so there was a there was a, a a moment of opportunity, if you like, to engage with Republicans around this. I think the Republican movement as a whole was looking to get off the hook uh, on punishment violence, but. The problem for them was that in a context where policing was not seen as legitimate, there was a serious demand from communities for punishment violence, for protection, as as communities would have seen it from crime, antisocial behaviour, drug dealing and so forth. So there was a a pressure on the Republican movement to respond to that. Um, And and that was all happening in a context where so an expectation on the part of community and a sense of responsibility as well amongst Republicans um, that this was part of their jobs, inverted commas, not only to protect um, their communities um, from the other side, be that loyalists or, or, or state forces, but also from antisocial crime. And so that there was a space, basically um, a political space for engagement with Republicans and loyalists um, around these issues in trying to find nonviolent alternatives. And, and the, the framing of that um, ultimately was around restorative justice, attempting to move away from punishment violence, to engage in efforts at dispute resolution which were framed on nonviolence, on protecting the human rights of everyone involved, um, and, and, and in doing that in a way which ultimately allowed these community-based initiatives to develop relations with the state, including most the most challenging was developing relations with the police, but done at the pace of the community themselves. So in a context where you, you just simply couldn't impose a relationship between community and police where that hadn't existed. And so that had to evolve over the course of a, of a number of years. And restorative justice therefore played, played two roles. One in challenging quite deeply embedded cultures of violence and exclusion against alleged antisocial offenders. And at the same time, once the Republican movement as a whole um, had joined up to policing and, and said, OK, it is now OK, we will take up our positions on the um, Sinn Féin will take up positions on the policing board and on local commu- uh, community police accountability structures, encouraging young Republicans to join the police. But that macro deal required it required relationship building on the ground. And so Community Restorative Justice Ireland became a key bridge for building relationships between historically estranged Republican communities and the PSNI. So it was playing both functions, challenging cultures of violence, moving away from violence, but also at the pace of the community, creating a bridge and a relationship between the police themselves and historically estranged Republican communities. And there's different styles of restorative um, practice. So the classic would be victim offender mediation, you know, with, where you'd have a one to one encounter between a victim and offender, usually mediated by a professional. It can involve a um, broader range of stakeholders. Family group conferencing is called. So you could have an offender with members of their own family and other, you know, often crimes and antisocial behaviour don't just affect one person, they affect the family of the victim. So you could have a broader group of players. Um, Sometimes in neighbourhood dispute um, uh, uh, style restorative, you could have 20, 30 people involved. Now they're complicated to manage and some watching uh, (laughs) some of our local practitioners managing large groups of people where, you know, tempers are hot. They're brilliant at it. Like it's a, those are not easy things to manage. Um, but they're just really, really skilled at doing this. One of the joys, actually, for me, watching the projects evolve over the last uh, uh, two decades has been seeing ex-combatants deploying skills that they learned in prison, for example, in mediating disputes, and then using that that, that experience of negotiation and preparation and, and all of that, and deploying that in such a positive way around resolving disputes. So it can it can be there are all kinds of different styles of it. Some, you can also have restorative justice that is explicitly or restorative practice actually that is explicitly linked to the formal justice system. You know, in the courts, a court order can include a restorative component. But also restorative practices nowadays um, can be located anywhere within schools, within businesses, within the health sector. It is a it's a way of organizing and managing dispute resolution and a set of values and, and, and practices that basically give you the how to. How do we address conflict? How do we address that in a way that stops it from happening in the future, that addresses and, and gets offenders to take responsibility for their action, and that empowers victims and addresses their needs, but also responsibilizes communities? Because one of the things that happened in our context was that when punishment violence was the norm in working class Republican and loyalist communities for antisocial behavior, uh, communities themselves didn't have to take responsibility for that. 
They just had to demand it, but someone else did it. You know, so you could have a very bloodthirsty, there was a real appetite in local communities for violence. Being visit and anti-social offenders, people involved in drug dealing, people involved in you know car crime and all that, were not sympathetic victims, and they did not receive much sympathy in the communities in which they were often terrorizing and torturing. Um, and so, it, it, cultures of violence became normalized in that context. And so, one of the things in restorative justice that you do is you try to challenge that, and you give and responsibilize the community itself. So, take ownership and responsibility for dispute resolution in the community. And then that challenge is kind of hard right-wing attitudes to punishment because you're involved in it yourself. You're taking ownership and responsibility. Whereas if you're only demanding violence and retribution, but then your hands are clean, you're just saying, okay, we're walking away. You know, I've just, I've just gone to the Republican movement or to the UVF saying, okay, I want that little so-and-so kneecap. My hands are clean now. I have no responsibility. Someone else does the dirty work um, for that. And that was actually for us a resource as well because certainly within the Republicans that we were engaging with, they were tired of it. They were tired of it. It's dirty work and um, is not why people joined the Republican movement to be involved in that kind of activity. And they were also pissed off at the community demand for violence when the community wasn't having to do it itself. You, it was Republicans or loyalists who were having to do it. And so that gave you a space to engage. And so we sort of just tries to do a lot of complicated things in what looks like a very simple encounter between a victim and an offender. There's a lot of complicated stuff happening around that, you know, which is why it's so interesting. And when it works, it's a beautiful thing. You know. Two most common misconceptions um, with regard to restorative justice are number one, that it's a soft touch for offenders. Um, and that secondly, that particularly for community-based uh, versions of restorative justice and in a post-conflict context like ours, that it allows and facilitates uh, the continued paramilitary control and domination over local communities. Those would be the two big misconceptions. They're both wrong, but those would be the two misconceptions. I mean, first of all, the, the notion that it's a soft touch for offenders. Um, I've been doing this for 20 something, 25 years probably now. Um, and countless times I've had offenders telling me it's much easier to do time than to engage in a restorative process where you're having to take responsibility um, and address a victim as a human being in, for example, in a mediation session. Um, and people talk about the strong feelings of personal shame and all of that. And in restorative justice, we try to use that. So there's a positive version of shame, but there's also a, a sorry, there's a negative version of shame. There's also a positive version of shame, which in where you take that, that a person's feeling of shame and embarrassment of what they did and turn it into a positive. Well, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to address the hurt that you've inflicted? How are you going to take responsibility for that? And then longer term, how are you going to address your offending behavior? Um, and for people, particularly people who have who have morphed into you know an antisocial or criminal lifestyle, jail time becomes normalized. Jail, courts, these are just people, this is just part and parcel of, of your life. Whereas if you're um, encouraged into a situation where you're actually addressing your own behavior and we are addressing relationships with with um, between yourself and, and the person you've hurt or indeed your broader community it's a, for a lot of people it's a lot more challenging and um, it's also as, a, as, a, as an initiative it's a, a lot more effective um, in terms of, of uh, reconviction rates I mean restorative justice is much more effective than, than jail and um, the second misconception in our context and the one that we had to fight a lot, a lot is given the origins the particular origins of both um, CRGI and alternatives in that they um, emerge from dialogue directly with paramilitaries, with, um, Repu with um, Republican and loyalist activists. There was always uh, uh, an easy dismissal of both projects that, oh, well, this is just another attempt by um, paramilitary forces in our community to maintain control. Um, and what that meant was that uh, we had to work harder to demonstrate our bona fides. And what that meant is that in this jurisdiction, we developed the highest standards of practice anywhere in the world. Actually, uh, John, Professor John Braithwaite, who would probably be the, the world's leading authority on restorative justice, has written that several times, that the, the standards of practice that evolved in the Northern Ireland context from, from CRGI and alternatives are the most comprehensive in the world. And the reason for that is that they had to be. They had to demonstrate how squeaky clean they were in terms of protecting the rights of anyone who came into contact of it because the projects emerged from direct dialogue with um, uh, armed actors, but also because ex-combatants were prominent in, in the running and the, and the managing of these projects, the delivery of the services. So having to work really, really hard at demonstrating your bona fides meant that both projects became really excellent projects with really excellent standards of practice. And I think even people within the statutory sector who 20 odd years ago would have been very cynical about the projects given their origins. I think 
they they won credibility and respect for the quality of the service they delivered, but also because they were they were working to the highest standards. 